Welcome back to another episode of Heart of the Matter. Today, we are honored to welcome to our show, Colonel David Hunt. Colonel Hunt, a U.S. Army retiree with six years of combat experience, is the president and founder of DAR Incorporated, an international security company. Colonel Hunt's accomplishments include leading a special operations operational detachment, serving as a tactical advisor in Bosnia, and being retained as a security advisor for eight Olympic Games. A regular on Fox News, in which he provides expert analysis on war and terrorism, Colonel Hunt is the highest rated contributor on cable TV the last 14 years. The four-time Purple Heart recipient has been referred to by Bill O'Reilly as the best military analyst in the business. Colonel Hunt, thank you for being here. You're welcome. I want to start this interview asking you about ISIS, the so-called Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. America is leading airstrikes in both countries in an effort to push them out of key regions, as, long, as well as uh, supplying consultation aid to the Iraqi counteroffensive. You're on record as saying that the United States should not have gotten involved in this situation. Why is that, and what would you have preferred? Yeah, 26 years and four presidents. We've been 20 bombing Iraq for 26 years. Uh, through four U.S. presidents, and it's gotten us nowhere. Uh, we lost 4,400 guys in Iraq, well, 40,000 wounded, had a half a billion Iraqi civilians killed, spent almost $2 trillion, didn't work. Uh, ISIS is a regional issue uh, for right now. I think, for example, Ebola is a lot more dangerous for us than ISIS is. But we we can't continue to just bomb in this terrorism war. There's so many other things that we have to do. And we, we've proven for 26 years that bombing, killing terrorists, killing Muslims is not the answer. It hasn't worked. So we've got to do economic, religious, political. We've got to do a lot more work uh, uh, in, in the, that part of the world. It's the last thing we should be doing is bombing. And we've tried it, like I said, for 26 years in Iraq and it didn't work. So I didn't want, I, I think we've, I think my, actually I'm quoted as saying let it burn. You know, I, I, this, this, is a, this is an Iraqi issue right now. I don't think it would have happened if the Democrats weren't in trouble for losing the Senate. Uh, and two guys who had their heads cut off and more importantly, they, they had, there was on YouTube. If that hadn't occurred, I don't think we'd have been, we would have been bombing. What do you think of Tom Friedman's argument that ISIS jihadists are baiting the United States into this bombing campaign, spinning it as a crusade against Islam, as a way to unite secular Iraqi and Syrian Sunnis against American forces. Yeah, I think Friedman doesn't have the connections to make that kind of a deal. He's, I mean, he's a brilliant writer. But the, from an intelligence gathering standpoint, we don't know. I mean, it's, 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 very, it's, over, it's, very, it's kind of condescending and oversimplifying to, to say because they cut a British, because it's a, allegedly a British man who cut some heads off, Americans and Brits, therefore they're trying to goad us. They also sold or returned 60 hostages. They returned 40 Turks, for example. They were, it was for money. So it, uh, it, I, I don't know, I, I don't agree with his premise because he's got, he has no, re, he's got no background to say, say that. Uh, we don't really know. We know how ISIS was formed. Qatar and Syria spent money to have a wedge group in the Syrian rebels. They thought they, they became uncontrollable. And now they've got Ba'athist military leadership and a collapsed Iraqi military and making about $6 million a day uh, because of the banks they've taken over and all, a lot of other things they're doing. So I, that goading, is, I think, is oversimplifying it. In your opinion, what do we look for to determine whether or not this campaign is a success or not? If it stays like it is now, when the administration has said three to five years, uh, ISIS stops, is stopped north of Baghdad and is kicked out of Iraq and Syria. That's, but it, that won't, can't be done from the air. It's it just no war like this. And this is an insert, this is a guerrilla war. This is a, war on terror, more guerrilla fight, can be won from the air. It can't be done. I mean, it, 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 ISIS has, has proven not to be stupid. They've had, they've got five divisions, that's about 40,000 men's worth of equipment that the Iraqi military left on the battlefield. 
uh, half a billion dollars in the Mosul Bank. This, this is a, a capable group of very bad most, men and women, mostly men, uh, that we will not be able to defeat from the air alone. In the wake of the publicized beheadings of James Foley and Stephen Stotlaw, there's a lot of concern and fear that ISIS and other Islamic jihadists will continue to use this strategy of kidnappings and beheadings as a way to weaken or break the American will. What do you believe should be the United States policy in terms of negotiating for a POW's release with our enemies? I think it's got to change. I think that uh, because of what, because of our reaction, if we're going to go to war, because men, people are having their heads cut off, then we better do a lot more to get them out. For example, we might want to consider, which is going to be tough to, from a press standpoint, stopping people from going to these areas. Uh, that it would be aid, work, aid workers. It would, it would hurt a lot of effort. But we probably, if, if Going to war is our response to people's head cut being cut off, which has happened all over the world, by the way. Happens every 10 days in Saudi Arabia, as an example. Not American heads, Saudi heads in hands. If that's going to be a reason, then we need to come up with additional strategy and willingness to do other things uh, to get our people back. Because it seems to me disproportionate. Not that the life isn't worth something, but it's it going, it, we're going to war because we had two men's heads cut off. That's pretty significant. Let's move on to other aspects of foreign policy. Many experts believe that there's a historic opportunity for the United States to reach a compromise with Iran over its nuclear technology, considering that Iran's economy has faltered greatly. Do you believe that a deal is imminent? And if so, how does this impact the United States future on the war on terror? One of the unintended consequences of the Iraq war was creating or have increasing Iran's influence to the point that now it's the superpower in the Middle East. The problem you have is that if, as we're fighting in Iraq, Iran and Russia are in the middle of this. We're actually going to have to, we have to, have to coordinate with Iran in Iraq. And they're actually supporting the Assad regime. We are bombing in Syria, so we're actually having to coordinate with Iran in Syria. Right now, Iran has got all the cards. So my answer is no. There's not, what, Iran has no reason to negotiate with us on the nuclear business. They, they don't, and, and they, they don't believe, and not as anybody else, that Israel is gonna, for example, launch an airstrike again because of the way, the way that the Iranians have built the nuclear facilities. They're so far on the ground, so deep, that would take a nuclear bunker busters to get in there. And nobody's going to be dropping nukes anytime soon. President Obama has repeatedly asserted his wishes for a world without nuclear weapons. Sure. Yet he has reduced the, our nuclear arms stockpile far less than any of his three immediate predecessors. And he's also spent a lot of money to strengthen our current stockpile weapons, ensuring a future generation of nuclear weapons for this country. What do you believe will be the value of the nuclear weapons threat for the United States in the future? And do you see criticism of Obama's handling of nuclear weapons justified? I, the only benefit I, I can see in my lifetime has been deterrent. The problem with that philosophy is that we, we saw some amazingly large buildup between Russia and ourselves, but, and it went nowhere. Now we've got probably 12 countries in the world that have nukes. Um, I hope it, that's all there is, but there's probably at least 12. And others trying, because it's not very hard anymore to, to build a nuclear bomb. So I don't think the administration, the last two administrations actually, last 10 years worth, has paid much attention to this question. It seems that we've, Everyone who's got them has accepted this deterrent business. If you drop a bomb, we're going to drop a bomb. The issue, though, that has to be paid attention to, I, my opinion, is that ISIS type of organization just buy one straight out. That they have so much money involved. And Pakistan, for example, is so porous, so easy to get at their nuclear arsenal. There's, there's so much corruption in that government and others that that is a bigger fear for me than 
And, and that's, that's a policy problem, not concentrating, whether it's Obama or Bush. It hasn't been, hasn't been well done. There's a lot of discussion now about the much anticipated documentary that's released called Citizen Four about the journey and actions of Edward Snowden. You've done work with the NSA, and I'm curious to see what your opinions are about Obama's handling of Edward Snowden's case, and how do you think it will be resolved? Yeah. Snowden is a traitor. He sold money. The only way he got into Hong Kong is he, had to, he gave up to the Chinese, and the only way he's staying in Russia as long is he gave up what he had to the Russians. Uh, my, my issue, there are traitors in every, in every country. It's not, you were not unique that we've got, um, the problem is that he, it was so easy. And it's compounded by the, the following. As we're sitting here, the, National, the U.S. government doesn't know two things. How much and what he took. And second, that's actually two things, three things, and how he did it. So my, as far as my answer is, I'd like to get those three questions answered. How do you respond to those who argue that Edward Stone is an American hero who has exposed corruption and deceit of the American government? Yeah, he hasn't changed at all because if you, if you walked out in the middle of the street and asked somebody the difference between Ebola and Snowden, they, they wouldn't know. Right down in Brunswick. As, it, as advanced as the town of Brunswick is, so the, it hasn't changed. It, should, it, it may have, should have. The argument is a great philosophical argument. You know, it's freedom of information, heroic versus what I've called him as a traitor. The problem is that, again, going back to what I said earlier, we got scared as a nation after 9-11, and we allowed a lot of things to happen. Patriot Act, except a lot of things to happen. Snowden hasn't slowed that down at all. And, we did, and there wasn't enough of a, of a groundswell to stop anything. I mean, nothing changed except people got embarrassed. The WikiLeaks thing actually caused more of a stink, more of an embarrassment. The reason it did, and that was at a secret level, that was a very low level of security it was released because it was embarrassing State Department information and opinions about world leaders. WikiLeaks, you know, it was a much bigger issue. I mean, from a public relations standpoint and, uh, and interest. Snowden, if I haven't heard that question in three months. Nobody cares about it. It should care, but we don't. And therefore, no change. Finally, taking a look around the world, we see that 2014 has been a year short, no, with no shortage of foreign policy and military crises and threats from the situation in Gaza to Ukraine to ISIS. As a presidential election, is two years away, what questions do you pose to potential candidates about their handling of situations that exist now and situations that they anticipate to happen in the coming year? A couple of things we've let slide go, go south based on this war on terror since 9-11. One of them is, is our freedom, our, we've allowed way too much government involvement in our lives we've, because we get afraid. We as a nation do not do well when we're afraid. We create things like Homeland Department of Homeland Security, TSA, uh, NSA surveillance, and, and on and on. We, we, we don't do well with it. Uh, I would like the issue of terrorism to, to be discussed because it was only a brief moment in the last presidential election. Things like you know, Gitmo and other issues have been tabled for politics. Uh, and so that I'd like to, to see the discussion, let alone come up with a list of questions. I mean, it's, the list of questions is simple. But you can't even get the word terrorism out of anybody's mouth in any of these elections that are happening, except from a political standpoint, one side wants to blame the other for not doing enough in Syria or Iraq. But as far as a national policy, or what are we, are we really okay with everything you say in that's your cell phone being stored in Utah, this huge um, technical farm that was built in the last five years? Um, are, you, are you still okay with going through TSA the way? to an airport and all of that type of thing. I think we've, it's time, just wish there would be a discussion at a national level, there, is, there isn't. Uh, we end every interview with a, a rapid fire round of, of questions. So I want to ask you your favorite military movie. Hmm. That's a tough one. I wish it was te television. Favorite military movie. 
Longest day, probably. Um, yeah, longest day. Historical figure, military figure you admire the most? Dave Hackworth. He, yeah, he was, he's one of the last hundred years, probably the best soldier we've had. He was died as a colonel, died a couple years ago. But that, yeah, he would be, and my father, they got to go together. Yeah. Favorite place and least favorite place you've traveled to because of your work commitment? Favorite place right now would be Italy. Um, least favorite place, Russia, anywhere in Russia. Third world country. Colonel, thanks so much for joining us. It's nice to meet you. I'm Gabriel Frankel. This has been Heart of the Matter from Bowdoin Cable Network. We'll see you next time.